I finally did it. What'd you do? We're in the same place. Yeah. We're working on something together in the same place. It's really uncomfortable because Mike is looking directly into my eyes. Where else am I going to look? Well, you do this when you record in person. For the listeners, I'm looking to the side of the room. I'm not looking directly at the mic. No, I don't. You didn't know this before we started, but I will be locking eyes with you for the next two hours. <laughs> Oof. I think I'm not sure I would have agreed to this if I had... Are you really going to look... No, st- I'm okay, not. Okay, okay, thank God, because it's really weird. There will be times where I'm going to... Like, right now I'm looking at you, but yes. I'm not going to look at you for the whole time. Okay, I appreciate that. I'm looking down now. Thank you. We're at WWDC again. We are. But last year you made me record in a hotel room, and you were in your hotel room, and we used Skype. Yes, that's true. But this year, mm-hmm. you suggested, why don't we record in person? I didn't suggest it. I feel like you did. I didn't. I didn't suggest it. You suggested it. Okay. And here's the thing: I agreed because I have a lot of audio equipment in my room right now that I really didn't want to unbox. Ah, uh, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, put the button on me. <laughs> Last year I was all set to go, and I was thinking, oh, I think shows are better if you record separately. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but this year, I just didn't really feel like unboxing all of these boxes. So here we are together in the same room. Have you thought about the potential? issue if you really enjoy this no we'd have to record in person all the time well that's fine okay you can you can come out to me every every time we record a show to your office uh no uh, to, uh, i can have a rental space <laughs> the recording studio you can yes. go to the recording studio. yeah we can have uh we can have a central london cortex recording studio okay but i don't i don't think this is going to happen mike okay well we'll see you never know you might like it i don't know i'm feeling very uncomfortable oh. right now would you like to turn around <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am know, very surprised I, that we're looking at each other face to face. I did consider, I did consider, why are you shaking your head? It would have been so ridiculous. I did consider us facing in opposite directions in the same room, but I thought, let me try not to be a burden upon other people. Well, let the me, whole time me... <laughs> I would be turning around to look at you. <laughs> I just think, what, what's he up to over there? That's what you'd be thinking. Well, I just like, I'd say something, you know, and I'd turn around and be like, what do you think? Mm-hmm. But that wouldn't make any sense. Would it, it wouldn't make any no. sense, no. no. So I mentioned it, but we're in, we're in San Jose mm-hmm. for WWDC. So we recorded last year at WWDC in San Francisco. Yeah. So this is Apple's developer conference. Um, and we just come here to hang out, right? We have like a bunch of friends who attend the conference and there's a lot of periphery events and mm-hmm. we were doing some stuff at Relay FM. And what do you think of San Jose? Well, I'm really glad because last year I wasn't, I wasn't 100% sure if I was going to go to WWDC and I ended up just sort of going to see the thing. And now I am doubly glad that I went last year because I have a frame of reference to compare the last San Francisco WWDC to the now San Jose WWDC that everybody's talking about. Ooh, what are all the differences? Mm -hmm. And I would have felt very left out of 40% of the conversations about how San Jose is different from San Francisco. So I'm super glad that I went to the one last year, just for the comparison for this year. I mean... In many ways, I have no business being here. I'm not here as a developer, so I have a very different perspective on it. But my feeling from what I've seen is it seems like San Jose is a total win for the conference on almost every single metric. And then there's one metric that everybody agrees it's not a win on, and that's not a metric I care about. So for me, it's it's ticking 10 out of 10 boxes for better location than San Francisco. Yeah, the the metric that I'm assuming you don't care about is that bars don't open as late. Yeah, bars close early, restaurants close early, and on all the conversations, everybody's complaining about it, and I'm sitting there secretly thinking, yes. <laughs> it's like, right. I get an excuse to go to bed. Yeah, or, or like, it pushes us into more reasonable, more quiet locations. You know? That's true. Oh, no, we can't be at a loud bar until one in the morning. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> it's like, actually, tick in the plus column. So I'm, I think it's great. Yeah, I think I spent more time in the hotel bar than mm-hmm. than I would usually, and I do actually agree with you. Like last night, there was some kind of rowdy party going on in the hotel bar, so we came back from like a meal, and we come into the hotel, and there were just these two groups of tables, about eight people in on them, and they mm-hmm. were just shouting at each mm-hmm. other, like just just at the top of their voices. Nothing was happening, but these people were just shouting, and went like. I don't want anything to do with this. So we all so we all just bundled into my hotel room and just sat around <laughs> chatting and there was like eight of us for a while, mm-hmm. we're just hanging out. And that was way nicer because that's what you know, that's what I like and, and one of the things about a lot of these conferences is really 
what you want to do is just hang out with the people mm-hmm. and, and talk to your friends. Because not only are we catching up, there's also just a lot to talk about this week, mm-hmm. right? And everybody's sharing things that they found out and pieces of information and like experiences. So people just want to do that. But mm-hmm. those places are usually where alcohol is served and where bars are mm-hmm. and the stuff like that. So it gets a bit tricky. Like it reminds me of whenever we set up meetups. So we did a meetup here and I've done a few in London now. I always have to spend extra time explaining to the bar or or the venue that we're in that I want the lights on and no music. And they can't understand right. why what they think is going to be a party right. would want that. And I'm like, people are just going to be talking to each other. Like, music makes it worse. Yeah. It's not a party. We don't, we don't want music. <laughs> Please, no music. Mm-hmm. But I agree. Like, this is a vastly superior location than downtown San Francisco mm-hmm. for an event like this. Basically, for WWDC, the majority of attendees and the the majority of people that are coming to attend periphery events, like me and you, we don't leave like a four or five block radius of the hotel or the convention center. And that area of San Francisco, as we discussed last time, it's not a nice part of San Francisco. No. And I mean, I don't know how the, this this five block radius of downtown San Jose compares to the rest of San Jose, but it is vastly superior to that of San Francisco. Um, there's again, there are food options. There aren't as many. There are bar options. There aren't as many. None of them are open as late. But it works out just fine. Like, I know why people have been looking for those things. But like you, I'm really good with what we've had. And there's a nice little coffee place near our hotel. And, uh, you know, it's been really nice. And I feel like I can walk around the streets and not worry about things like I do when I'm in San Francisco. So, I mean, I think that everything has been a, a big win. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when you go to these places, it, it is a thing that I'm, I'm very aware you're judging a city on a three block radius. Yep. Right? So, oh, yes. San Jose. I know the whole city. I, I know three streets. Right, but it's it's like that. That is the entire perspective. But the reality of it is, that is the conference world. Mm-hmm. So those streets matter a lot. And you know where we where we were in in San Francisco and where the conference was. Those those streets were an apocalypse. They, yeah, they were terrible. Like yeah, I'm sure, sure there are plenty of lovely areas in San Francisco. I've been to them. But the the place that the conference was. It, it made San Francisco seem like a dystopian hellscape. Yeah, it's, it's like there is there's a bunch of lovely places in San Francisco, but you're either going to be staying like a 20 minute journey away from where everybody is, mm-hmm. or go, or like everyone's going to have to pile into taxis and go out for any dinner. Like it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It's just where the venues are and the convention, the, the area around the convention centers here and there are just populated differently. Yeah, and the tightness of the radius adds to the experience because it dramatically increases the probability of running into people, mm-hmm. which is which is nice. Which I also think is an, an additional benefit of San Jose is it really does feel like WWDC has descended yeah. upon this area, mm-hmm. which was population-wise much smaller than the same block radius in San Francisco. And I have had the experience numerous times of walking between the various hotels because I'm on my way to go see a thing or go meet a person and while doing that bumping into somebody else and being able to say hi quickly. Yeah. And that's really nice. Like that's a, such a nice experience that it it almost makes it like a like a faux college campus yep. for a brief period mm-hmm. of time, which is great. Like that that's that's what you want for this kind of experience is oh, I have I have chance random encounters with people that I know or yeah. that I've just met. And it's it's very nice. WWDC has completely taken over, right? Like San Francisco takes the conference in its stride. Yes. It's like it doesn't make a difference because there's always a conference or yeah. there's always something. Yeah, I was really aware of that feeling in San Francisco of walking out of the hotel and standing on the street and feeling like, oh, I have been absorbed into yeah. the metropolis of San Francisco. And the probability of bumping into someone was very low. Like I think the number of times I bumped into someone on the street from the conference in San Francisco was maybe once or twice at most in the whole the whole time that I was yeah, there. Yeah, because I think it's changes the mindset. Well, like whilst all those people were also there, mm-hmm. you don't pay attention to people as they're walking around mm-hmm. because they're just Joe Schmo mm-hmm. going to see Alcatraz, right? Yes, yes. The other thing that I think helps with that feeling is 
Uh, I don't I don't know if I just tuned into it less in San Francisco, but it feels like the developers have these really identifiable jackets. Okay, so there are jackets every year, but the jackets this year are more. They stand out a lot more. Yeah, they really do. They have they have these really they're very cool looking black jean. They're black of Levi's jackets. jackets. They're oh, Levi's, Levi's denim jackets with yeah. which Apple kind of branded with WWDC 17 on them. Like previously, they were these kind of like hoodie type things mm-hmm. with big numbers on the back. Mm-hmm. So they were actually in theory more noticeable because it was just people walking around with huge numbers on their back. But they were so nondescript that you kind of would blank them out. Yeah, I can't even remember what they look like. But I feel like these jackets are, are super distinguishable. And then a plus that I really like is it, is I've heard from the people who have been inside the conference that they're able to do some kind of scavenger hunt for all of these pins that they're yeah. getting on the jackets. And I find I find my brain really tunes into these little pins, mm-hmm. like a little swift pin or a smiley pin. It seems like there's some kind of scavenger hunt going on. And what I think this is great for, just, just an idea for a conference, I think that is a genius conversation starter. Because you have the thing where you can identify, ah, here's the jacket, the person's at the same thing. And it gives you an in with almost everyone to be able to say, oh, well, what did you get that pin for? They're also encouraging, uh, like, it does encourage swapping and trading. Hmm. WWDC this year, again, so just from talking to people who have been inside and mm-hmm. or standing at the outside of the convention center past the barriers and longingly looking at the convention center, uh, that's been my experience <laughs> of it so far. Yeah, but before we started recording, I was telling Mike that the saddest <laughs> I have been so far was... On keynote morning, I thought, I just arrived in the city and I thought, oh, I'm going to go look and see what the conference center looks like. And I went out there to take a look and I just felt like the saddest excluded person yeah. on the outside because I have no badge. And then to to top it off, I'm looking at, ooh, the conference center looks amazing and there's this huge, exciting line. And as I'm standing there looking on the line, like my friends start waving to me from the cool insider part. And I was just like, it might, the skies might as well have opened up and rained down upon just me just in that this moment. One yeah, just this rain. one column of rain going right down. Like that, is, that is 100% how I felt in that moment. I was like, oh, I'm so sad. Uh, but so yes, that is our experience from outside the conference. Yeah. But. But it's 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 more festivaly. Yeah, that that is exactly it. It feels like there is this festival throughout the whole thing. People are engaged in all of these different activities. All of the peripheral conferences are like literally next door or just across the street. Yep. So you can pop between different different things. It's it's been really great. It's really fun. I think even as someone who's not directly participating in it, the collectible pins are a genius idea that other conferences should totally pick up on as as a way to encourage communication and, and yep. recognizability among conference attendees. So I've been to a conference that did this, and I actually think this is the conference that inspired Apple to do this. Hmm. So the last XOXO in Portland, when you checked in, they gave you three pin badges, but there were like 12. Hmm. And if you found one you wanted, they were encouraging pin exchange and they were like on the Slack and they have like an XOXO Slack for attendees. They had like a whole room for like pin swapping. And the pins are so reminiscent because mm-hmm. there's these enamel pins in all these colors. I think that they might have like cribbed the idea from there. But it's great. It's a great one. Yeah. Whoever came up with, let's say XOXO came up with it. It's a great idea. It doesn't idea. matter. It's it doesn't fantastic matter. Yeah. because it's like you'll see someone and be like, oh, hey, I love your pen. I, bet I love that one. And you swap and you chat. It's like it's a nice thing. And as mm. you say, like there is basically there are certain uh, events, certain talks or sessions, as Apple calls them, that if you went to them, you were given a badge. Yeah. So like, and, and it was also, I think it's a way for them to encourage attendance mm-hmm. like there was a special badge for the accessibility sessions oh gee okay that is total genius yeah right? it was either the session or the labs so you in the labs you go and talk to the engineers so they can give you advice on it so if you went and, and participated in that so to help people who have different disabilities use your applications they will give you a pin oh, that, that is that is so smart I, I, i've been aware of talking to some okay so here's the thing that I, here's the thing that i would just never normally do because everybody is so recognizable and because of the pins, I have on occasion struck up conversations just very briefly in the elevator, right? Which is the thing like I would never yeah. do, but it's like it's begging you to do it. And some of the pins yep. are really interesting. And so I've just said like, oh, well, you know, what was that one? Where'd you get it from? And I've been aware that there's that some of them seem rarer than others. Yeah. But I didn't realize tying it to 
session attendance is an is like another great reason to do that to encourage people like yes we want as many people to just come to the accessibility session so that they're aware of mm -hmm. what exists that is is really great it's really great and if you think like a conference like this there's so much standing in lines you mm -hmm. know like you're lining up for everything having an ability to be able to turn around and talk to someone is great because so many people come on their own mm -hmm. or like they know people that are here but aren't inside right Right, like I have, I I know a bunch of people who like, I know who they are. Like with their, we're friends, but they don't know anybody inside. Right. Or like I've spoken to a bunch of people in the same way. Right. Like none of their coworkers got a ticket, just them. Mm -hmm. So they're going in, and, and like it seems like, well, I mean, it seems like it's nice in there. I wouldn't know because <laughs> uh, we don't get to go in. Uh, but it looks like it, it enables people to talk to each other in a, in a in a fun way, and I think that's really good. Yeah, I do it think is. that's really good. But Monday, you mentioned the keynote, so it was quite a day. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by Casper. Most people don't really think about the science behind a mattress, but the Casper mattress was designed by a team of 20 engineers and perfected by a community of nearly half a million sleepers. The Casper team are really just a bunch of engineering nerds digging as far as possible into the science of sleep and the technology that they need to deliver it. They've put their expertise into creating a mattress that combines pressure-relieving supportive memory foam with a breathable open cell layer for all-night comfort. And hey, don't just take my word for it. Recently, Fast Company named Casper the most innovative brand of 2017. Casper mattresses are super easy to order. They arrive in a impossibly small box, which you can actually move upstairs. It's not like the size of a shoe box, but it's a box that you can move around on your own, which has a mattress in it. And then when you are getting into the room, you take it out, you just take it out of the plastic packaging and it breathes to life in the space that you need it to be. It's really cool. And buying a Casper mattress is so easy and completely risk-free. Casper offers free delivery and free returns to the US, Canada, and the UK, and they will ship it directly to your door in that impossibly small box. With Casper, you can actually get to sleep on their mattress before you make a decision. Because we spend a third of our lives on our mattress, you want to get a feel for it before you commit, and that's why Casper will give you 100 nights to try it out. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Dive deeper into the science behind the perfect mattress and get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash cortex and using the code cortex at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks to Casper for their support of this show. We watched the keynote together, which you got to see me scream in a bunch, I think, was, <laughs> was something that you experienced. Yeah, there was excitement all around on all sides. It was... It was really fun. I think again to to compare the experience last year versus this year. Like I really I really liked going to WWDC last year. I th I felt like we had a very very great time watching the keynote last year at the Twitter headquarters. Uh -huh. It was awesome to be invited to that. And it was super fun because that was the first time I had ever had the experience of watching a keynote not by myself. I hate the other ones, watching the other ones now. Mm -hmm. Because when at WWDC, I, I, for the last like four years, will watch the keynote of other people. Mm -hmm. So when like the iPhone event comes around and I'm just sitting in my living room with Tim Cook on the TV, <laughs> it's so boring. Okay, so, so like the WWDC stuff, I always watch on my own. But the iPhone keynote event, my wife is always very interested in that. Uh, and so mm -hmm. we at least watch it together. Yeah. And she's very excited. So I, I, know, I always feel like, oh, we watch the iPhone event together. It's like, oh, pour a glass of wine. Like, we'll sit back <laughs> and now impress us, Apple. Show us your magic. And so I have a very nice association with that one. But the WWDC one for the past many years has always been like, oh, I'm just a sad nerd <laughs> on my own watching it. Please so, tell me about APIs. <laughs> yes. And it's like, well, the API slide went by so quickly. I'll have to wait for the technical keynote. <laughs> uh, Yay. Yay. Yes. Yeah, which, which, like, it was, it was really it was really interesting and a very interesting experience to watch it last year at Twitter in a room full of, I don't know, it must have been 50 people. There was a lot of people. Yeah, there was there. a lot of people there. They had great food. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> I, I, I swear, I swear, Twitter, if you're listening, I still think about your breakfast burritos. Oh, God, it was so I, I real, I real, Every once in a while, I'll just remember, like, that breakfast burrito at Twitter is so good. If I remember, you were on a real strict carb diet at that point. If you were just like, it's going out of the window yeah, today. Yeah, that was, that, that was, it was too good. It was too good to pass on. 
But so that, that again, it's it's great this year to have a mental comparison because this this year was a very different experience because there were I don't know was eight of us. I mean, there was yeah, eight of us. Eight of us in in a, a hotel room watching it, and obviously we're people who have come to WDC. We're all really interested, really invested in what's happening, and that felt like another whole very great way to watch the keynote with a smaller group of friends, and also. Because you know everybody in that room, you know what particular people care about or are interested about. So even in some of the sections where I'm less interested, it was still fun to see the reactions of my friends who I know like, oh, for them, the Mac section, like they're they're really interested in what's yeah. happening here. And and like I didn't come into this with big hopes for the Mac. So it's like I, I really enjoyed having mm-hmm. those different perspectives live in the room. So it was, it was really it was really fun. It was really fun. Yeah, and also in those scenarios when it's just a group of friends, like I, I'm more willing to show my true emotions, <laughs> right? Than if like I'm in an office of like, some big company, right? There was no hooping and hollering at the Twitter no. headquarters because you have to pretend like you're super cool in front of Twitter. You just uh, you sit back and you're like, oh yeah. Hmm. Thing is though, Stickers. this was a much more hooping and hollering year, I think, than yeah. last year. I think one of the funny things about last year's WWDC, I mean, we did a big event. The, the, the big live event that we did mm-hmm. and we recorded a show and I remember that the whole time I'm like okay whatever they talk about is what I'm gonna how I'm gonna plan out the content and there wasn't really a lot you know like the, the plan initially was for me and you to talk about whatever happened to the iPad right. and nothing happened yeah um, so it was it was a a kind of an underwhelming WWDC mm-hmm. last year. Like it, there was there was some cool stuff. Like I still use and like stickers. I think it was a good addition. But that was like the biggest thing. That was their headlining feature for for like consumers was just these changes to iMessage. Mm-hmm. But this year it's like everything. Everything. Everyone got their thing this year. Yeah. Like there is nothing going into WWDC. There is nothing that I wanted that they didn't address in some way yeah, here here's here's my feeling of of what they managed to pull off at this wwdc it's like every everybody in the world went into the this hall to watch to see tim cook came on stage and said look under your chair everyone there's a box for you and you could reach under your chair and you could <laughs> open the box and there was something just for you yeah. in the box for everyone in in that in that theater so that's what they managed to pull off. Like there was nobody who didn't get something that felt like this is the thing you're waiting for or the thing that you want to hear about. So very, very yep. impressive keynote. Like I had some things that were on my total wish list, mm-hmm. like Apple embracing VR. Mm-hmm. Like, oh man, yeah. I had no expectations, honestly, for that to ever happen. I thought that they'd missed the boat on it. Mm-hmm. And you know, and, and I've been talking to some people who know their stuff, um, and people have been tweeting at me to kind of give me information about like some of the graphic stuff that they're using. Mm-hmm. And again, as you would expect, it's nowhere near top of the line. Mm-hmm. But it, for me, it's the. It's just that Apple are understanding that VR is something that the Mac should be able to do. Yeah. And they're starting to make machines that are powerful enough to, to cope with it. Mm-hmm. That's what I want. I mean, I've been recently, like we were talking about the Corsair recently, and I have been just like thinking, oh, what have I got to do? But now I, now I just think if I just wait a little bit longer, I don't think, I don't think the iMac Pro is for me. Mm-hmm. But like I'm just kind of keeping my eye on things that there are these external GPUs that they're working with, and just maybe this Mac Pro in 2018, like maybe some one one combination or not of these machines could be all I need for decent gaming and VR on my Mac. Yeah, yeah. The the VR thing I also agree felt totally out of left field yep. in an already very packed keynote and a thing that they gave a bunch of time to. And I love that they did the VR demo on the regular IMAX. Yeah, like that they, was good. They weren't they weren't showing off like, oh, we have a pre production IMAX Pro on stage, and we're going to give you a demo, a VR demo with our mm-hmm. five thousand dollar machine. As I know, the, the, our next generation of regular IMAX can do VR, and I, I found that totally surprising and and really very welcome as I was watching it happen. I feel like a feeling of just relief. like yeah. Just like we have had the conversation about VR and you have always very much been pushing this feeling of like, I think they're missing the boat on this, that that they're not placing a bet on the table. And I too didn't expect they'd even address it, but to, to see it done in such a way to yep. be given time. And I also thought it very interestingly done in a 
done in a way that's a demo about working in VR as opposed yeah. to gaming in VR. They are talking about making stuff mm-hmm. as opposed to playing games. But the fact that they have support for the two two of the largest game engines and Steam, it's yeah. like well, their games are part of this. Yeah. But like Apple is, they're focusing more on the cr- creation of 3D mm-hmm. content right now because there are no games that can run. Right. So I, I think that's why they're like, oh, make your games mm-hmm. is kind of what they're saying. Yeah. Because that's the message. Because you can't take a current game and just start playing it. So they, I think they're pitching it right. But I, I think people are getting a little bit too hung up on the verbiage that Apple's using. VR is gaming. And if they're not doing that, then they're crazy. Mm-hmm. And they are doing that. It's yeah. clear. Mm-hmm. And they put mm-hmm. a Steam slide up. Like it's gaming. Yeah. But there's just no games. Even if in many ways it was a demo out of necessity, I still think it was a very apple demo to focus on creation. That, o- that always feels like one of the, the bullet points that they want to hit with yep. their products and their services is look at how we can enable you to create things. And so if in, in a year or two, they may be able to demo an amazing VR game on the Mac, but I can imagine them continuing that theme of liking to show off what you can make in VR yeah. as opposed to just doing a graphics demo. They really don't. I mean, they're as a company, they have games, there's games on their platforms. They are not a games company. Like, this is a thing about <laughs> Apple. I think it's really funny when they say on stage something like, oh, we're the biggest gaming company in the world yeah. because of the iPhone and the, and the iPad. Like, like, yeah. By default. Yeah, it's exactly. By default, you are. But like you're not really. No. You just you let these games exist on your platform, but you're not building controllers or all like you're not a gaming company in in the way Nintendo is a gaming company. Yeah, I mean, it's just like even like Apple's back end systems are just not built for the way that game developers mm-hmm. work. Like that it's just not. But it's just because they have the largest software distribution platform in the world, mm-hmm. right? So people just keep putting games out on the system anyway. Right. Right? Because it's like a billion devices or something. Yeah, something crazy. Right? So it's like, you know, it's similar to Android, but there are many differences. Yes. Right? And and I think that it's like they talk about games and they have games, but they're not a gaming company. Yeah, they're not, they're not, they're not in their sole gaming company. No, it's like, oh, I guess we just sell games now too. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how they kind of stumbled into it. Yeah. But I'm really happy. Like more powerful Max is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Right, and the ability to do VR gaming is a good thing. Yeah, it's it's a really good thing. But of course, the biggest, the biggest stuff for me and you was iPad. Mm-hmm. Right, like that's what we were looking for. I mean, it was the make or break year. Yeah. for the iPad, because you know we got iOS nine, we got all the stuff that meant that me and you could be working on our iPad all day because of iOS nine. Nothing happened in ten, mm-hmm. and it was like, well, okay, show us what you got, mm. and they did. They show us what they have, and. There are, I think, maybe two of, like hugely fundamental changes to iOS, which is an exposed file system mm-hmm. and management of that, mm-hmm. and the way that they have adapted multitasking. They basically burned multitasking down mm-hmm. and rebuilt it, and it all focuses around a dock now. Oh, and drag and drop as well being the addition to multitasking. Right. In, yeah, in my head, I kind of roll that up with multitasking, yeah. even, even though um, it's an incredibly different thing. Yep. It, it, the two of them on stage look like they go so well together that it's, it's, I find like my brain is not mentally separating them out as two distinct things, even though obviously they are. Exactly. And the way I've been hearing people talk about these advancements, and I agree with it completely, is that there there's a lot of, People saying, oh, they, they taught the iPad to be a Mac. Mm-hmm. They taught the iPad to be a, a real computer. Mm-hmm. But I think that what Apple has actually done is taken these fundamental tenets of what it means to be a personal computer, boiled them down to what they are at their core, and then built them for iOS. So the ability to drag and drop them easily move around files and content in which apps are aware of each other the ability to be able to have multiple things on screen at one time and the ability to be able to access your files wherever you want them. Because all of these things, especially drag and drop, they make more sense to me here than they do on my Mac. Mm. Well, the iPad always has the advantage that you are directly manipulating the yep. thing with either your hand or with the pencil. And I I think from a 
From a UI designer perspective, that is quite a challenge to think of how do you want to make something that works like that. But it also has the big advantage that once you see someone do it and once you yourself do it one or two times, it's like your brain can lean on its its like muscle memory of the real world. And so the, with the drag and drops, it's like, oh, yes, of course, I touch this thing. And I know that in the in this digital universe, when I touch something else, like it will fly to my other finger and then I can move it around. And you only have to do that a couple of times before your brain gets the metaphor. Yep. There, there isn't there isn't that level of indirection of oh, I'm copying these files from this thing and I don't see the move. I just see a progress bar. I, I think a lot of people have a hard time with that and it's, it's why many people struggle with file management on a Mac and it's, it's why lots of people do like an iPad because they don't have to use that stuff. But for the more pro power iPad users, it's very great to be able to do the drag and drop stuff and also have that feeling of, oh, it's, just, it's so easy because I'm just tap, tap, tap. I can see what's happening. And it just, it slots into your brain in, a, in an easy way. And just the things that I'm learning about the drag and drop and the way that it works is, is so very clever. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's enabling and keeping all that security in place. But it's, apparently it's, it's work for developers, but not as much as it may seem to be initially. And it's there, there's been some demos of some really interesting stuff about the way that other applications can extract relevant data. Mm-hmm. So, for example, there's a demo that Apple has been doing as part of their presentations where they have the uh, Photos app and the Maps app side by side. And you take a photo and drop it onto the Maps app and it takes you to the location the photo was taken. Oh, nice. So there is all of this stuff where like, you as an app developer can say what types of data you're looking for mm-hmm. and also what your files contain. And when you drag one over the other, that application is looking for the relevant information that it can extract from any file mm-hmm. and then deals with it. So it's very, very clever stuff. And it really does feel like just a massive win. Mm-hmm. Like all of the really big things that we needed on the iPad have been addressed. Yeah, I would I would agree with that, and it's very it's it's very interesting because okay, another reason why I like being physically here at WWDC is is related to this because when you're sitting in a keynote and particularly this keynote which has the magic box for everybody they're running through everything on stage and I swear I've never seen them go through more stuff faster. You know those those word slides that they have at the end were hilarious sometimes where they where they they run through the main things and they say like oh we've done a bunch of other stuff for iOS and they put a word cloud up on the screen and then they move on sometimes those word clouds were up for for like 2 seconds and they're like we got to keep moving on and they were up for 2 seconds with many many words and and we were all on Twitter going like did anybody catch that what, what was what was on there i need to know what was i couldn't even see it for 2 seconds um so there was so much stuff and when when you're seeing them demo things like drag and drop on screen and demoing the new versions of app switching and all of this stuff, I'm sitting here watching it and I think, I can see what they're doing and this looks amazing. But there is always that part which is, but I don't really get it until I can play around with it because you you know they're showing you things under certain circumstances and like they've set up demos to do particular things and and you don't have an ability to understand how does this really work and what are the edge cases and so being a WWDC is fantastic because as soon as that keynote is over someone is going to be crazy enough to load the beta of the developer build right on their iPad yep. immediately and this year it was David Sparks, who runs two podcasts, if I'm right, on this network. He does. uh, Which you should go listen to. Especially if you're listening to Cortex, you should in particular listen to Free Agents that he does with Jason Snell. Mm -hmm. If you like this show, you will almost certainly like that show. I think so. I think 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 so. There's there's going to be a lot of overlap (laughs) in that Venn diagram. Uh, But yeah, so David Sparks had that, the, the build on his iPad super fast basically immediately yeah yeah he, he must have been one of the very first people yeah, in I the whole so. of the conference to get it loaded and being here at wwdc then means 
uh, you know, very shortly after the keynote has happened, uh, he was nice enough to let me play around with his iPad, uh, mess up lots of things, <laughs> and, and rearranging all his <laughs> rearranging screens. all of his icons, dragging and dropping emails, and like, Woo, how, how does this work? Where does this go? And like, <laughs> what happens if I do that? Like, I, oh god, I would never let someone touch my. He was no. he was incredibly generous. So thanks again, David. Uh, but we got to play around with it, and and that's the moment where. As a person trying to understand what does this mean for how my workflows are going to happen, what does this mean for the future of the way I do work on a device that's deeply important to me, that's where the understanding yep. comes in. And in the first 20 minutes of, of playing with it, I think we both had the same experience of, okay, now that we have our hands on it, you start out with a bunch of concerns because what you're realizing is, oh, the way I do everything is broken. And the way I'm, I'm used to managing a bunch of windows is not going to work. And so you start out by thinking, oh, God, I, like, I don't know how this is going to... I'm not sure if this is a good thing. But I was very happy that over the course of those 20 minutes playing around, I felt like, oh, okay, I understand. We're not now focused on individual apps. We're focused on the equivalent of spaces on the Mac and switching between these and playing with slide over. And very quickly, I could see how is this going to change the way I work and from, from that, it's like, okay, some things seem a little clunky, but it's partly me just getting used to it. And I was overall very, very happy at the end of it, feeling like this is, this is great. Like this new dock is incredibly strange. I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff to figure out, but I was, I was really, really happy to, to have an opportunity to play around with it and get a bit of muscle memory feel for how this is going to work. When the Apple Watch originally came out, it was weird. Mm-hmm. So from a software perspective, there were just a lot of things about it that were really weird. Yeah. And then watchOS 2 improved a little bit. And then watchOS 3 felt like they had redesigned watchOS based on the fact that they'd actually used the watch. Right. And I feel like that this version of iOS on the iPad has been made by people who have been using iOS on the iPad seriously over the last two years. Yeah. That That is a great comparison. That's a great comparison. Because... We have to start again in some ways, but I feel like the scale is way better. Like it will scale better over time because you have more flexibility about the way that you arrange your workspace. Mm -hmm. Where if we would have just continued with the previous split view app picker, even with just additional tools to manage that, I think the idea of this pulling in and pulling down would have eventually gotten to be feel really old mm -hmm. when now we're like you can set up these pairs of applications and they live together mm -hmm. you can swipe up from the dock and bring things over it's basically like oh we have used the Mac for such a long time mm -hmm. and we've never needed to really change the way that you open and play with applications mm -hmm. and this is very similar to that again I, I think that there are benefits there are things that are good there are things that are not as good but overall, I feel like it's really focused on trying to make this a more scalable and usable interface over time yeah. without needing to burn it back down again in two years and restart. Mm -hmm. Tim Cook started off the whole presentation about the iPad as this is the biggest iPad release ever, which I hated that to begin. <laughs> I was like, you're, you're setting expectations. Yeah, never do that. Way too high. Yeah. Like, someone should have told you to do that at the end. Mm -hmm. But I mean, but it does feel that way. Though. It's like a comic coming on stage. This is going to be the funniest show you've ever seen. I have some like, real great jokes yeah. for you folks. Well, now it isn't. <laughs> Get ready to laugh your butts off. Here we go. And But it, it, it is, though. I mean, he was right. It yeah. is. It, and there are like a million little things. And there are a million little things that me and you don't even know about yet. Mm -hmm. But like even there are things like you can record the screen now natively on iOS, yeah. which has been just like an eternal frustration for so long. But you can do it now. Yeah. There, there are like that simple ability to record the screen. I can think of so many times over the past few years where I have wanted to do something animation wise on the road and i've thought oh if i could just i could just record the screen and oh right oh, i can't oh yeah cuz you could just record the screen and move stuff around yeah so th there are ways that i could have done 
not the greatest animation, but I could have done fine mobile animation with some screen recording. God, that. But it's but the problem has always been like, oh, you need a second device to record. Yep. And it's like, okay, it was a deal breaker because the whole reason I want to record the screen is I don't have my Mac with me. And now I might as well just use the Mac if it's here. So that, that's going to be really helpful to me. So there was, there was a thing I wanted to do for a vlog where it was the big travel vlog that I did recently. Mega vlog. Mega vlog, the travel mega vlog. And I wanted to... You should trademark that. I'm going to. I'm yeah. going to do my best. There's, there's, there's something that I wanted to do to show... Like you know, you have those old like those maps, and you show like a plane moving from place oh, to place. Yeah. I know, I know the exact thing that you're trying to do because I've tried to do this a couple. It's a hard to get it to look right. I couldn't do it. Yeah, you want to do like the Indiana Jones effect. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I didn't even know where to start really with the map apps, mm-hmm. but I could pull that together way easier on iOS. Yeah. Because now I could just record the screen and just physically move the plane from the place to place. If you can do screen recording on an iPad. There are a lot of simple animations that become way easier. If you want to do complex stuff, you're still going to want to go back to oh, the Mac. Yeah. But th- like, there's a, I can see a lot of, of things that people can do with the screen mm-hmm. recording. And I'm just thinking about animation, but I feel like that really opens up a whole world of, of other things that people can do. I mean, even, even just like doing tech support for other people. Yeah. Like, I just want to record me doing the thing and then I can send you the video file and you can just see it right now. Like, this is what you do. In the inverse, when mum calls and she's like, I can't work out why my phone yeah, is yeah. doing this. Like, why do I have a little phone icon in the top left? I was like, I don't even know what you're talking yeah, about. That is, that is always, <laughs> that is the biggest tech support problem is person on the other end who needs the tech support is also the person who very often doesn't have the technical vocabulary to describe what they're looking at in ways that makes it immediately understandable. And sometimes you will hear a visual description of a thing. You're like, I don't know what the hell that is. And then when you see it, you go, oh, (laughs) right. It's the thing over there, right? That's called the WYSIWYG, right? And it's like, you just did, if you'd said WYSIWYG, I would have known immediately what it was. An hour ago, we could have got through this. But you're describing the shape of it. And it's like, in my brain, I just don't think of it that way. Yeah. So like, I think this, the screen sharing it's such a little feature, but it's it's one more thing that removes the need for a Mac for a bunch of stuff. Because you've been able to do it if you plug a cable in and you re- and you do quick time is. It, but it's yeah. just like I never think of it. Yeah, and it, it's it's such a hassle that you're you're never going to want to do that as a workflow. Mm-hmm. Today's episode of Cortex is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the US. Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. For less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron will deliver seasonal recipes with fresh, high quality ingredients to make delicious home cooked meals in 40 minutes or less. Each meal comes with a step by step, easy to follow recipe card and pre portioned ingredients. And by shipping the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, Blue Apron is also helping to reduce food waste. Their freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient arrives in your delivery ready to cook or they'll make it right. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week, or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. For example, some upcoming recipes include peach honey glazed chicken with mashed sweet potatoes, collard greens, and Thai basil, and spiced zucchini enchiladas with creamy lime and tomato rice. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone, and they deliver to 99% of the continental US. There's no weekly commitment, so you only get those deliveries when you want them. Check out this week's menu and get three meals for free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash cortex. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals at Blue Apron. So don't wait. Go to blueapron.com slash cortex today. And we thank Blue Apron for their support. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. While we're talking about the screen recording, I will will ask you because I don't don't 100% know what you think about this. The very controversial change to the look of control center ah uh, yeah okay where do where do you describe it for the listeners in case yep. they're unaware and then tell me where you come down on this with ios 10 control center went from being this single panel page of shortcuts to three pages so you would swipe up your three pages if you had any home kit devices installed so you would have like play and pause and some app shortcuts and then you'd have all this big music card and then you would have this like home kit set of switches mm-hmm. and now 
I think mostly because of how they've changed iOS on the iPad, where that same animation now brings the dock up instead. Mm -hmm. They have moved all of these switches into one place, and it's now customizable to an extent where Apple has exposed more switches available of their own system stuff that you can add in, and you can also 3D touch where you press into the screen on the newer phones and it will bring up additional buttons. Like, for example, you can have an entire Apple TV remote in <laughs> Control Center now. Uh, so I saw that. It's, it's very funny looking on yeah, the screen. Very strange. But So they, they've moved it all into this one panel. It is this big box of buttons and switches and faders and spinners and gosh knows what else in one screen in all different sizes. So it looks like a kind of weird jigsaw puzzle of buttons. I think it's beautiful. I love it. It is so my aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Like I am a sticker person and it effectively looks oh, like God. they have just taken oh, I stickers. would never have thought about it that way. I would never have thought about it that way. But as soon as you say it, it, it does look like an array of yeah. stickers. It's just like... I can appreciate having as much functionality as possible in as small a space as possible mm -hmm. and just minimizing the UI that goes around it. I think it looks brilliant. I think it looks fun and weird mm -hmm. and I can move stuff around. Yeah, I'm really I'm really on board of it. As 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 very interesting. So this this is the thing that people seem very divided on. And, this is the thing. And a lot of people are coming down on the oh my god, it's it's atrocious. And I am with you that I, I actually like the look of it. I think it, it is a bit messy in some ways. And I can see why a lot of people would react poorly to it. But uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's fantastic too. Mm -hmm. And if someone doesn't like the visual look of it, I think you can still say that this is an appropriate place where Apple is making, you have, you have this, this slider of like, how good does it look versus how well does it work? And Control Center is one of those places where I am very happy if I was on the design team to say, look, we need the slider very far over into the how well does it work? Because the whole reason Control Center exists is because you want to just do something quickly. Yeah. And you want to just flip up and press a button and have a thing happen. And I think the the redesign of Control Center you know really really for quite a while now has has leaned too hard on the oh we want it to look nice and pretty when it comes up and has been a little bit frustrating on the usability side. Yep. I love that you can add or subtract the buttons that you're not going to use. I haven't gone all the way to customizing those buttons. Next year, I think. Looking at you, calculator button. Yeah, I just no desire. Yeah, I just like, oh, calculator is terrible. P calc's way better. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm so yeah. It's I wasn't sure what you would think of it, but as soon as you say it looks like stickers, of course you'd love it. <laughs> I'm gonna love of it. Of course it's, you'd it's love everything it. about me. As I've been saying to you, that is my aesthetic. That yeah. is it. Yeah. That is one hundred percent it. Yeah. What I like about this is in regards to the function of a form, the, the whole point of Control Center is to give you quick access to things, and quick access comes from muscle memory. Yeah. The problem with Control Center now is when you swipe it up, now I know what, it, okay, the, the way it is built and the way it works is it swipes up to the last panel you had open. Uh -uh. But what that means is every time I swipe it up, there is a pause where I have to realize if I'm in the right place. Yeah, you have to visually look at the screen and your brain has to process which action is going, and, and already now it's like muscle memory is over. Because it's fine if I press play on a song and then I need to skip a song in two minutes, right? I know it's there and I yeah. swipe it up and I hit the button. But tomorrow, mm -hmm. when I need to change the color of my light, mm -hmm. it's not where I need it to be. Yeah. And so that's why I am a big fan of this, is you are putting as much functionality as you can into one screen, which means I am going to know after a couple of weeks where all of those buttons live. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's, again, so like this is another feature, I think, where they're like, we've used this for a year and we have realized it sucks and we have to start again. Yeah, the, the, the three panel, swipe left, swipe right, it stays where you last left at control center was crazy making especially on a 12.9 inch iPad is like yeah. 
It's like insulting. Well, they could have fit yeah, it all they, on there. It could, they could have fit it all on. It's, 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 it's like it's there intentionally to drive mm-hmm. you crazy on the gigantic iPad. That was the most egregious. Yeah. I was like, it works great on iPad. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. doesn't work great on no. iPad at all. It's enraging on iPad. Little things like that is what makes me realize that we got this version of iOS later than intended. Because mm-hmm. that's such a weird thing to do but they're just like well this is how ios is because we haven't got anything else for the ipad yet so right. we're just moving these features on to all these devices right yeah this wasn't the only ipad news that we got though it wasn't just software we also got hardware mm-hmm. we got a lot of hardware mm-hmm. they refreshed the entire line yeah i i am i am very happy about this because you know, I had a deep fear going into this keynote. So I, I was very confident yeah. about iPad hi- hardware. Mm-hmm. But I had a really deep fear that what we were going to get is the new 10.5-inch iPad, which we did get. And I thought it was going to be all quiet on the Western front with the 12.9-inch iPad. Do you remember what I said to you at dinner the night before, Gray? What did you say? It's been we so busy. We were sitting around remember. at dinner and you and Marco were saying that you thought it was dead, dead, dead forever. And I said, if they update one, I believe they'll update both. And I was really strong on this. And you two were like, no, no, Tim Cook's a crazy man. <laughs> I wasn't sure it was going to be dead forever, but I, I, was, just, I was just concerned that, it, that something about it just felt in the, it might stick around in the same form factor for a very long time without any internal updates or anything. I was just, something about, something was just really nagging my mind about that. Uh, but that did not happen. Did not. And I was super psyched about yeah, that. I was, was good. so that was my that was the most excited part for me in the keynote was new twelve point nine inch iPad. So happy. So happy. Yeah, the, the ten point five is amazing. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna be buying one as soon as I get home. Mm-hmm. It isn't exactly what I wanted. Now why is that? Because I I know you have been very excited for this. And I and I feel like <sighs> It looks just like it did in all the rumors. Like it's, it seems mm-hmm. like this looks exactly like what we were expecting. Yep, it's, so, the, it's the exact hardware I expected it mm-hmm. to be. It is not what I thought it was going to be from a software perspective. So we had a 9.7-inch iPad Pro and a 12.9-inch iPad Pro. Right. A 10.5-inch iPad Pro kind of sits between the middle, mm-hmm. but it is doing literally nothing for the software to make it any different. So what I was hoping was going to happen was that the 10.5-inch iPad Pro would give me the exact same software experience as the 12.9, but shrunk down, so I would get two full-sized iPad applications Mm side-by-side. But it isn't like that. It's like with the 9.7, where you get this kind of like halfway between iPhone and iPad application if you have it split right down the middle. So if you have like two-thirds of the screen was one app and one third of the screen is another. You get one full iPad app and then an iPhone app. But if you bring them to the middle on the 9.7 and on the 10.5, you get this kind of like in between. Okay. Oh, okay. It's a different view controller on that yeah. one. Okay. Right. And that's how it's been with the 9.7. But on the big one, on the big iPad Pro, the 12.9 inch iPad Pro, you get two full sized portrait iPad applications side by side. Okay. And I was hoping that the 10.5 would be like the 12.9 mm-hmm. and that you would get like if you put two apps side by side, it's two portrait apps side by side. But that's not what you get. Right. The, the operating system would tell them you are a full screen app, mm-hmm. act like it. But it doesn't. But work they like don't. That. They they still say it's small enough that if you have a different view controller, it's using the more mobile yep. view controller. That's in, that's interesting. I, I I've never even really tuned into that on the smaller iPad Pro. Uh, but I can I can see yep. now immediately why that that is a a big considering factor in in which you're going to use. Because what I was hoping was, whilst I thoroughly enjoy the multi pad lifestyle, that if I got this iPad it might potentially mean I only need one Mm -hmm. because I will be getting what I hope to be best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. Yeah. So it's like, for me, I'm like, I'm I'm not trying to look a gift horse in the mouth with this, but I don't understand why they increase the screen other than to differentiate it from the regular sized device called iPad, which is $329 and is 9.7 inch in size and screen. I think that's the only reason is that they wanted to have 
9.7 is the cheap one. Then you have these two pro ones. One is 10 and a half inches and one mm-hmm. is 12.9 inches. Mm-hmm. And again, like if you're a company making these products, you should differentiate them. Mm-hmm. But there doesn't seem to be anything in that iPad that takes advantage of the additional size of the screen. And the reason that I'm annoyed about this is they made the iPad bigger. Mm-hmm. So the iPad itself is bigger to make the screen bigger for kind of no real reason, it seems. Right, but the, but the software is still treating it like it was go no to different. the mobile version. Yeah. Interesting. But I've played with one. I spent some time with one. And when you hold it, you don't know it's bigger, right? They kept the weight the same. It doesn't feel bigger, but it looks fantastic, right? The, having the bigger screen, I'm looking at my old iPad right now, and I'm like, look at all that bezel, you ugly, ugly little thing, <laughs> right? Oh, I- <laughs> Boy, he's he a looks, nice little guy. Little guy is right there, man. No, he's all covered in stickers. He has stickers. failed me now. Wow, that's hard. There is a there is a new hotness in town, oh. and this little guy ain't it no more. Wow, so sorry, buddy. But this is what Apple does, right? And it's done that. They mm. they, they they make the device you were perfectly fine with yesterday yeah. hideous today, <laughs> <laughs> right? And that's what they've done with this. Yeah, they have. So like, I, as I'm happy to have new hardware. It's got some amazing new features, which we're going to talk about in a second. Mm. But just from a pure, like, what the screen size mm-hmm. has brought me, there isn't really anything to that, that. Okay, that's interesting. That's that's very interesting. I think I didn't I think I think didn't understand that with the view controllers and, like, this is what you were looking for yeah. with it. So that makes, that makes it a lot more sense about why it's amazing, but you're a little bit lukewarm on, on it because of that lack of that feature. Yeah, it's like, I'm really excited about iPad software. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited about the new iPad hardware. Mm-hmm. But the combination of those two and the 10.5 hasn't really changed anything. Right, right. Like, independently, they're both brilliant. Mm-hmm. But together, there's nothing special going on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the crowning feature of this device is a new display technology that Apple's calling ProMotion. It encompasses a bunch of different things. One of these things is a 120 hertz refresh rate. Now, the best way to try and describe this, so it's it's refreshing the screen more often, which means they can show more fluid animation. Right. But you know when you see Apple do this, you see lots of companies do this. When you're watching a movie, like a promo footage or an advert or something, and you see someone holding a device and they're using it, but it looks fake, right? Mm-hmm. And it's because they're using rendered animations with like a green screen. Mm-hmm. So they're just overlaying it. And it always looks weird. Like the fingers never really kind of exactly where it should be. And all the animations look too smooth. That's how these new iPads look. Because the animations are so smooth, the first time you see it, it almost looks broken. But it just doesn't look real. It's fantastic. Yeah, I really wish I had seen one of these things in person. You can say it. (laughs) It's okay. We're here. People have them. It's okay. <laughs> you can say it. It's fine. Okay. Just wanted to, just wanted to clear. This yeah. is another great reason to come to WWDC. You get to people have it's, hardware it's, it's and you like, get to see it. And thing, things, things get left on counters. Who knows uh-huh. how, right? Who knows? It's, who knows, who knows? how? Uh, it's like, woohoo. <laughs> it's interesting. I am, I am, I don't know how to put this, but I am, I'm going to be real curious to see when I have one for a while playing around with it and what it, what it's really like because. There is a certain kind of unreality to it. it yeah, and it is. I think I, I am in the minority of, of people who... Okay, so there's, there's two kinds of people in the world. Mm-hmm. People who notice frame rates and people who don't. And I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by how some people just can't see the difference between... Like when you shoot on your iPhone, if you put it in 60 frames per second mode versus 30 frames per second mode. And I think it looks like an abhorrent disaster if people shoot in 60 frames per yeah, second. Yeah, okay. So you're on the same page yeah. with me on this. Yeah, it's like I will not shoot in 60 frames per second no. on my phone because it's like, yeah, like I hate it. I, I, it's, it's, like you're showing I, me too much. It's almost like it's a, a reality uncanny valley. Yeah. It's like it's, it's so close to infinite frames per second. Uh, 60 is just inches away from infinite Uh, (laughs) but it's not actually looking through a transparent piece of glass at a thing happen like that's sort of the feeling of looking at 60 frames per second footage and i have a little bit of that same feeling looking at the 120 frames per second animations and scrolling on the new ipad i think i'll get used to it but it is weird but what i have but the thing that is a concern for me is it feels like a little bit of a retina transition is that I think 
when I got used to retina screens, I had a hard time working with non-retina screens. Yeah. And I'm, I'm concerned about, I think I will get totally used to the 120 frames per second. But what I'm worried about is then switching back to screens that are at a lower frame rate once my brain is used to the idea that, oh, things on a computer, they move in this preternaturally smooth way. And then if it doesn't quite look the same, I, like, I think this is going to be coming everywhere. I just really hope it's in the new iPhone. Um, I think it will be. I, I really do think it will be. I mean, because, again, I don't know enough about how the technology works, yeah. but people smarter than me are telling me yeah. that it's the display technology in the chip. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the iPhone's going to get the best yeah. display Apple can make and the best chip they can make. It's not like something like the True Tone stuff where it right. needs additional sensors, which is why it maybe hasn't come to the iPhone yet. Mm. Um, it seems like it would be easier to do than True Tone was mm -hmm. in the iPhone. Yeah, uh, so I, I expect you're right about that. So I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm very interested to see once I actually own one of these things and use it for a while, like how it, how it goes, how this transition goes. But the thing that to me is amazing is the decreased latency in terms of the pen usage. So the other thing that happened, this is part of this whole system called ProMotion, is they have increased the uh, refresh rate of the, what the pencil is able to provide. So in the current versions of the iPad, the frame rate on the screens is 60 hertz. What it's able to do is, is 60 hertz. And it is refreshing the screen at 120 hertz to find pencil input. Mm -hmm. So it reduces lag and increases smoothness. In the new devices, they have a 120 hertz for the output of the screen and a 240 hertz refresh rate for the pencil. Yeah. So they are continuing the smoothness by right. doubling that. The smoothness has been doubled. Yes. More smooth. I've also heard that they're doing some interesting things with uh, better predictive technology about which way your hand is going sure. with the pencil mm -hmm. like, and all these things. But I, I think if you go back, if you go back last, oh, I'm sorry, if you go back two years ago when we were originally talking about how desperate we were to get our hands on on a pencil and see what does it look like and how does it work. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, yeah, like I, I see because now you're now you're here in person. I see you making this face and you're trying to do the mental math on was it two years ago and the answer was yes, Mike. Whoa. Yeah. We've been we've been doing this for a long time. Very long buddy. time. Very long. Episode time. fifty two can can throw you off. <laughs> yes, it can. But but so when, if you go back and listen to those old episodes, we were desperate because we wanted to see it because we're both very sensitive to the pencil latency and just essentially didn't trust anybody's reports of like, oh, it's great, you can't tell the difference. And like, I don't believe you for a moment. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sure I will be able to tell. And I, I think if memory serves me, my verdict was the latency was acceptable, which as opposed to the previous style I that were like using hot dogs on a screen was just, was totally unacceptable. Just completely, why even bother? Yeah, why even bother? Just a tale of misery. But so when I'm using like my, my current 12.9 inch iPad, I can see that there's a little bit of latency with the pen, but it's fine. Like it is acceptable and I have gotten very used to it. Uh, but when I, I got a chance just for a few minutes to try the pencil with what is my personal favorite handwriting app and I think the best, which is Good Notes 4. I got to try those two together and it was eerie the, for the first few moments because it literally felt like, oh, I am I am writing with an ink pen on a piece of glass. And bear I, in mind, like this is without, I assume the app developer being able yeah. to optimize. This, this is exactly it. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I wanted to see it on GoodNotes in particular because I feel like that developer has done an amazing job with the handwriting. Like if you are really sensitive to this stuff, you can see there's a, there's at least in my opinion, there's a very big difference between the handwriting on, on something like Notability uh, versus GoodNotes. And I think GoodNotes does a really great job. But so it's like pre-developer uh, optimizations it's it's uncanny and yeah. I, and i and i'd say like this i only used it for a few minutes but in those few minutes i feel like i can say that the latency was unnoticeable that if it felt like it was right under the pencil tip the whole time and it really is a very big subjective feeling change using it that way so i i am really looking forward to editing the scripts with the pencil on the screen 
And uh, you you know, we haven't discussed it, but you know, I put up a wish list before uh-huh. the keynote went up of things that I wanted. And yep. one of those things was Apple Pencil 2. There are a lot of things that I still want in an Apple Pencil, mostly it not being in goddamn white uh, and maybe aluminum with a little grip on it. But all those things aside, I feel in retrospect like I can half tick that box because even though the pencil isn't new, the experience of using yeah. it with the new hardware makes it feel like it was a new one. It, like if, if they, if someone had handed me a pencil and said, "Oh, this is the Apple Pencil 2 and use it on the screen," I would be, I, I would be saying like, "I cannot believe how you guys got the latency down. It's amazing." Yeah, it, well, it's one of those things with these t- combination of two pieces of hardware and software. Yeah, is they actually didn't need to update the hardware of the pencil at all. Yeah. to make this change, which is really impressive. Yeah, it, it's it it really is. Yeah, and I agree with you. I, I I was hoping that we were going to get more mm-hmm. from regard in regards to the pencil, like an actual new model, but right. that hasn't happened. So, I mean, the things that I and you want with this, I'm not surprised that they haven't bothered to change it yet. Mm-hmm. I feel like you can do that down the line. There's no there's no real need to make those changes right now, other yeah. than to just placate me and you. <laughs> right. In regards to the pencil, there were two interesting things here. One is if you have an Apple Pencil now, you can tap on an, an on a locked screen and start writing a note. I thought that was a genius interface yep. addition, yeah. So this is very similar to the way that the Samsung Galaxy Note series has been for a while. This is a little bit cooler in that you just start writing and you write on the black screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is really cool. With the with the on the iPad, you tap it and it just brings up a note which is sandboxed. Mm-hmm. You can't access your other notes until you unlock the until device. You unlock it. But you're able to just take notes really quickly, which I think is really cool. There's also like the ability to draw directly into some applications. Mm-hmm. So notes and mail have it. I assume this is a developer API as well where you're able to rather than enter a specific drawing mode, mm-hmm. you can just draw. Mm-hmm. Um, as well as this new screenshot function where you take a screenshot on the iPad, it, fl- it flies down to the bottom left-hand corner, you can mark up right, and yeah, send you, it. Yeah, you can grab it, draw oh, it. Yeah. So amazing. But what they have made sure to keep is the ability to maintain what me and you fought hard to keep, oh, yeah. which is the ability to be able to use the Apple Pencil as a UI manipulation tool to yeah. use it as a replacement for the finger to the point where there is some settings somewhere where you're actually able to turn off this instant drawing functionality so you can keep moving around notes. Now, I was really surprised to see that. Mm -hmm. I figured the applications where they allow you to just start drawing in them, they would take it away. Yeah, that that, I I was... Anyone who was following me on Twitter know, like I was getting very anxious because yeah. I was looking at a lot of... Because when they're demoing the, oh, here's how you draw on the screenshot thing, here's how you do a mm-hmm. whole bunch of stuff, it, it looks like you're just drawing on the screen immediately. And I, I was watching all of the videos incredibly closely. Like, I just want to see someone press a button with the Apple Pencil. And they never do. And I, I was excre- extremely worried about it. But yeah, it's such a huge deal, such a big, big relief that they were able to add all of these interesting features that are related to this instant drawing, which which we think was the like the original vision of how the pencil would work, they were able to add all of those features while keeping UI navigation with the pencil. I think it's 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 fantastic. I feel like if anybody on that interface team is listening to this, like I want to personally thank you for yeah. this because it's, it's so important to us. Yeah, as like, I cannot express in words adequately how much of a big deal that is to me. So like my my personal thanks goes out to anyone who worked on that and i and i understand that adding that additional functionality while keeping ui navigation was not an easy thing to do like and i can adding see a that. setting yeah as yeah. well right which i which rightly so in a lot of ways apple was very reluctant to add settings to things to try and keep mm-hmm. the user interface simple so to have that is great i, yeah. I did say at the time and i do mean this that if it was gone in certain applications like notes or mail, I would have accepted it. Mm-hmm. 
Because my problem at the time was when an Apple originally took this away in like, was it like iOS 10 beta something? Yeah, it was It was like, yeah, the second beta it disappeared. Of, of, uh, there was no reason. There was no added functionality. And I think I remember saying at the time that I would have been happy if we could see why. Right. And all it seemed like at the time was, boo-hoo, I don't like you lo- using my software in this way. Yes. Because there was no functionality that was being added. Like, this is functionality that is added. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I can see why maybe I can't scroll in Apple Notes anymore. Mm -hmm. But there was nothing like that. It just seemed like they were preparing for this then by just like, take it away, rather than trying to fix and and provide this solution. Mm -hmm. So if it would have been gone in Notes, I would have gone, okay, like, there is additional functionality here. I'll understand. But I'm really happy that's not the case. Yeah, I'm ve- extremely happy. Like, I'm more happy this way, but I would have at least accepted it. Like, we would be on this show right now, and I wouldn't be complaining. Mm. I wouldn't be begging like we did last time. Right. I would have said, it's a shame. I understand. I use apps that are like this. So, like, I use Notability quite a lot. And if you have the pencil, you have to use your finger as well to move. Mm-hmm. Or you switch into a different mode. And I get it. It's like, but, you know, it's always there. I can just swipe in and write, swipe in and write. Mm-hmm. It's fine. It was just like I didn't then want it to be able to go back to the home screen and tap around as I right. did. So the fact that it's all there and it's all maintained, it's such a big win for usability. And it, it is an accessibility feature. Yeah, it, it 100% is. Like, injuries through repetitive strain injury, RSI, which me and you both have you, to a much worse extent than me, it allows us to continue to be able to work for long periods of time because we can switch modes. Yeah. I was I was at I was at breakfast this morning with essentially eight people and there was there was uh, the youngest one of us at the table was describing that she was beginning to get the first signs of RSI. Mm. And and immediately, right? Everybody at the table, we are all people who make a living on computers. It, it, it was like everyone leaned in and was just focusing on how central this is. Like you are, you are younger than us. If you're getting the beginnings yep. of this, like focus on it right now. It's like everybody at that table who makes a living on, on computers in one form or another has to focus on an RSI issue or an ergonomic issue in their own way for their own thing. And, and yeah, that's why I think the pencil as a stylus for some people, and I'm in that category, is is a vital input accessibility feature and and it it really helps avoid injuries yep. to poor people the ability to use a pen on my mac with my wacom tablet and yep. my it saved my hand mm-hmm. like my right hand has been saved by the fact that i can use my left hand yep. and i'm un- i'm unique in this way where i'm extremely lucky that I am left-handed for writing and right-handed for mouse and trackpad manipulation Mm -hmm. because I can do the most magical thing. I give my hands a break. It's not just that I'm able to swap around. Like, I'm very lucky in Mm -hmm. this way. So all of my teasing as a kid for being left-handed, look at me now! (laughs) You know, like, so I'm really lucky that way. But it is this ability to be able to switch modes to grip in a different way to be able to hold a pen which is more natural to us because we do it from a much earlier age i don't think any of it's natural but for whatever reason that is more than holding a mouse Mm. which makes me think by the way i was talking to adina about this recently i wonder if and how these things will change in the next 10 or 15 years like if kids today or maybe in a generation younger than me or you won't get RSI problems in their hands for using trackpads and mice as much as we did. Well, um, my suspicion, my suspicion is uh, that if, like, if, and I know, I know we've discussed this on the show back when we were talking about this originally. But if you think about your hand, your your gripping muscles are much stronger than your opening your hand muscles, uh-huh. right? You can just feel it. And if if you hold out your arm in front of you and you open your hand, you can feel, particularly in your in your index and your middle finger, that holding it up is much more of a strain than keeping a closed fist. Okay, I, right? yeah, I see you where can, you're going. You can feel mm-hmm. it in your hands. And so the iPad as a touch surface is nothing but reach out with your hand and pull your index and middle finger back. 
right? You're doing that hundreds and hundreds of times. So everybody's body is different in terms of what are, what are they more susceptible to, but I'm willing to bet that a higher portion of the population, if you expose them to that repetitive motion of keep your index and middle finger up, I think a higher proportion of them will develop strained injuries as compared to keep your fist closed, which is the hand position for holding a pen. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That explains. Because I wonder, is like, is it something anatomical or is it just that we start at an earlier age, like so that we're kind of just more used to it? But mm. that, that makes a lot of sense. And I want, I really wonder, like, all this time using touchscreens? Mm. I don't know. I don't know because I think it is unproven right now how ergonomic the iPad is mm. and the iPhone is. Like, I don't think we really know. Yeah, we, we really don't. If it's just destroying us or not. Like, I think we're too too far. Oh, so my hands are really hurting me now. Like, now we've been talking about it, it's like, oh, my yeah. wrists. Yeah, you can feel, you can feel every feel muscle, burning. every muscle and tendon slowly degrading as you age and use them. <sighs> it's, it's like, I, I once, a while back, I can't remember the name of the, the story, but I once read a, a science fiction book about a race of aliens that are essentially made of sand. And so they have to be very careful about everything that they do and touch. So they're aware that every interaction with the world really costs them because they're like constantly <sighs> rubbing off on all of the surfaces. And we are just like that over a longer time scale. We're all fading into sand over time, Mike. Every time you touch your iPad. But anyway, awesome to keep you on navigation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Apple team. I really appreciate it. And today's show is also brought to you by Squarespace. Use the offer code Cortex at checkout and you will get 10% off your first purchase. Make your next move with Squarespace. They let you easily create the website for your next idea or project. And with the ability to grab a unique domain name, award-winning templates, and the access to 24-7 support, you'll wonder how you ever got a website made before. They have all of the tools that you need. Everything's drag and drop. Everything's awesomely customizable. You can enable an online store. Maybe you want to make a portfolio. Maybe you want to make a blog. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that lets you do that and way more. Maybe you want to have a place for you to play music, right? Maybe you're a band. You want a little music player on the site. You can do that. Maybe you want to embed a map so people can find your restaurant. It doesn't matter what type of website you want to make. Squarespace have the tools for it. There's nothing to install. No patches to worry about. No upgrades needed. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Squarespace Squarespace have got you covered. And believe it or not, their plans start at just $12 a month. But you can try it out completely for free by going to squarespace.com and you can sign up for this trial with no credit card required. You can play around with Squarespace, get your entire website set up, and then before you push it live to the world, you sign up for a plan, you want to use the offer code Cortex because you'll get 10% off your first purchase and also show your support for this show. We thank Squarespace for their continued support of Cortex. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. So we are both currently in San Jose, as I mentioned, and I'm going to be flying back home to London tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think the iPads come out on, like, Tuesday of next week. Mm -hmm. So I'll hopefully own one by about the time this episode will be coming out. Uh Uh-huh. So I didn't actually, this is my usual thing, I didn't buy it online. I want to just go to the store. Right. Get it in my little grubby hands. <laughs> I go back home again. Right. right. I'm not waiting around for no delivery, man. Oof. Man, did I tell you about what happened to me when I bought the Switch? No. So I bought three Nintendo Switches, right? Because oh, oh, God. Okay, three? I think I heard I heard a while back you were planning on buying two. <laughs> I bought. I, ordered, I pre-ordered three because I wanted to make sure I got it on day one. Because right. I've had so many problems, especially with Amazon. Yeah. Where, like, I, when I pre-ordered the PSVR headset and then they emailed me on the morning, they were like, oh, when I got them. It was just like the worst. It's just so annoying because I'm a terrible person. So you wanted to ensure delivery. This mm-hmm. is not the multi-switch lifestyle. Exactly. Okay. Ensure delivery. Two of, one of them I sold to my brother, one I returned. Okay. It was purely just I was just spreading the risk, okay. right? Got it. On the morning that they were being delivered, I had a guy coming to fit a fan in the bathroom. And he calls me and he's like, your intercom's broken. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> Fuck this. <laughs> I have three Nintendo Switches coming today. <laughs> so do you want to know what I did? Did you sit down in front of the door like a little sado? Got a chair. <laughs> sat it by the window. Mm-hmm. 
and I was watching out on the street for the delivery guy. Mm-hmm. And I like half an hour later, I see a guy, like an Amazon guy, walking around with a bunch of boxes. And I'm like just watching him. And he comes to the door and I like just open the door. I'm like, I'm coming downstairs. So I got, they all came. I like the idea that as you were doing this, the song, The Waiting is the Hardest Part by Tom Petty yep. is playing in the background. Because I can't do anything other than look. Because right. I've got to watch out for the delivery drivers, right? So I'm just sitting there the whole time. And I'm so right. pleased that it arrived early in the morning, not at like 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. I'm a terrible person. I'm aware of my terrible person. This, But I was really excited for Nintendo Switch. And do you know what? It's freaking worth it because I love that thing. I know. You're very excited about it. We took like an 11-hour flight, me and Federico, to get here. We were able to fill half of that time playing Mario Kart. That, that's that's good use of it was switch. pretty great it was pretty great so I'm going to be getting an iPad I'm going to be buying the 10.5 that's the one I'm going to be buying because it's the new one mm-hmm. and I want to try it out I want to see what it's like however I do not foresee me moving away from the multi-pad lifestyle mm-hmm. because I bring the smaller iPad when I travel mostly mm-hmm. it's mostly my out of the house computer so when I travel, when I go out to work somewhere, I will take the smaller one. And when I'm at home working, I have the bigger one. So over time, what I originally thought was how it would shake out is how it was shaking out. My large iPad Pro is like my desktop machine, mm. and my small iPad Pro is like my laptop. Mm. That's kind of how it is shaking out for me. But I want to get the 10.5 first because it's the newer one. Like right, it looks new. It has new stuff because green. It just looks new. But I intend on buying the bigger one at some point in the future as well. And I'm wondering what your multi-pad lifestyle plan is for these. And I I would expect it's going to be in the inverse. Okay, so my current setup is that I don't have a 9.7-inch iPad Pro that is mine. Mm -hmm. So what what happened in my household... (laughs) My household is in disarray right now <laughs> because the iPad mini seems to be going away. Okay, so let's talk about the iPad mini for a second. Okay. Where we should start the story is that over the past many years, the iPad mini has become for my wife her general purpose computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am astounded at, at her ability to use that as her everything machine. She must be proportionally the right size to use the like the how fast she can type on the iPad mini keyboard screen. Like it blows my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I look like a doddering old man when I try to use the software keyboard. I can blame that on Dvorak though, but it's still, it's like I, I could type so slowly, but she's just, you know, types Dvorak it all. Dvorak was perfect. But they don't have a Dvorak keyboard mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. iPad. Mm-hmm. That's what it is, Mike. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's been using that for years as her main yep. computer. Now, the position that she is in is going back to our earlier conversation. She uh, recently started developing her own RSI problems from using the iPad in, and I suspect, the same way of holding her fingers back over the screen. And so as soon as that started happening, I'm like, okay, we can't, you're not pushing this any further. And I gave her my small iPad Pro to use with the pencil. Mm, okay. And she totally fell in love with using the pencil. This is... Just like I was really pushing the Wacom tablet on you a long time ago, like the pencil is a great interface and everyone I have ever been able to successfully get them to try using it on a computer, they've, they've eventually adopted it and loved it. I feel like it's the same thing with the pencil. Once again, we will say buy a Wacom tablet, yeah. set it to pen mode yes, that's, and yeah. try it for a week. Yeah, yeah. If you you're have interested. to do it that way. That is the steps. Yeah. And also currently we are both using the Intuos Pro. Yep. Right. Yeah. It's, fa- it's fantastic. And absolutely fantastic. It has buttons that you can set to do shortcuts it's just yeah. brilliant it's 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 a really great piece of hardware but yeah so my wife uh then started using the pencil with her ipad which was my old 9.7 now where we were in what i thought was going to be the life cycle of the ipad i thought oh this will just be for a couple months nah, uh-huh. right and ended up being More like you great <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> it ended up being like a year that I was at yep. with, without mm-hmm. this small mm-hmm. ipad which I like I I know what this sounds like, but like I cannot describe how much of a disruption this actually was because yep. of the way that I like to split and divide my work. And I just 
It's just, it's just this creeping delay of every month. I thought, well, oh, like, well, I'm not going to buy another one now. Like, it's crazy. And every month that goes by, it's crazier and crazier. So she's been using that thing. But sound, sounds like we have something in common here because while my wife loves using the pencil as UI navigation, she'll never go back. She's not a big fan of the bigger size, mm-hmm. right? She has been saying to me, I can't wait for them to come out with the mini with Ugh. pencil support. And I have, been, I have been trying so hard to be like, I just want to be clear. I don't think this is going to happen. You just, you need to prepare yourself for that. And this has been a thought that has been, I think like I have been incapable of putting it in her, like lodging it properly in her mind because it keeps coming back up where it'd be like, oh, I'm really looking forward to having the mini with pencil support. I'm like, okay, but I think you should, you might want to prepare yourself that the mini might not be around. Like you, you might need to do this. So just just a, just a small thing to go, just to double back again, that UI that you were talking about before, where you can have the pencil touch the screen and pop you right into a note and just start writing. When I saw that, that UI alone made me feel even more like I really wish they did make a mini that worked with yeah, the pencil yeah. because that's a notepad. That UI yeah. is like it's begging to be a notepad it really really is begging to be a notepad i i I suspect since they didn't update the mini this time like it's not going to happen and especially not uh, like pen support with the mini if they ever do update the mini the current state of the mini is not good they are only selling one model of it it's the most expensive with the highest storage option yeah that is not a good sign along with a lot of rumors that are saying they're getting rid of it yeah it's it, it really isn't a good sign but but looking at that UI for quickly being able to write a note, I th- it just it feels like it's almost designed for someone mm-hmm. to have a little notepad with them that they can write on. Uh, it just it feels it feels so perfect, but it's not around. So, so you know when you're a fan of a technology company, especially Apple, mm-hmm. and someone in your life is upset at that company, <laughs> and then they start like treating you as if you're the right. issue here yes oh uh, yeah it's, it's like why are you getting rid of the mini yeah. like, and then, no, wait, and wait. <laughs> you want to argue on behalf of the company that you like where it's like you know um the argument that i had with adina about this not like we weren't shouting each other i was i was being apple in right. this right is that and it's like they know how many of these devices they sell of and if they sold lots of ipad minis they would keep making the ipad mini I think they're not selling a lot of iPad minis. Mm-hmm. And I know that there is this like, there is a cycle which you can argue that if you're not updating it, you're not going to sell it. But I think they're smarter than that and they can look at trends over mm-hmm. time. And I think the iPad mini used to sell really well, but over time has not so much. Right. Um, and the iPad mini that Adina owns is, a, is my old iPad mini 2. Mm-hmm. And I had been trying to convince her for a long time to update that. Mm -hmm. And now we're at a point where updating it is a ridiculous thing to do. Right. Because it is more expensive Mm -hmm. than the the regular iPad now. It's like it's like four or five hundred pounds to buy an iPad mini right now. So I mean the 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 suggestion of maybe you should use the the kitchen iPad, the iPad Air 2, that was not met very kindly as a as a solution (laughs) so i don't know what we're gonna do yeah it's it's interesting um i i know a bunch of people who are fans of the of the ipad mini like really big fans and it's only the same reaction that me and you had when we thought that like where is our ipad right right? like it's the same reaction of how dare you yeah (laughs) yeah it 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 definitely is uh just that is just a long way of saying one i'm I am sad on a personal level twice that there is not a mini pro because I know that could not be the more perfect machine for my wife. Mm-hmm. And I also think there would be a real market for a, like a notebook size thing to make handwritten notes on. Yep. Uh, that I, but I just don't think that's going to happen. And the first rule of multi-pad club is more iPads, <laughs> right? right? More like, iPads. you know, like a, a reason to own a third for a different use <laughs> is only a good thing. I personally would not get a, a mini pro. I, I really, really? wouldn't. I, okay. I really wouldn't have a use for it. I wouldn't want it. it anyway. Like, it's too close to the phone. Like, yeah. it's, well, you know. Yeah. Asterisk here. I love pencil support on the phone. Me too. And, and I'll tell you, uh, not from my end, but... Someone in my household 
occasionally curses very loudly when she's using her iPad Pro <laughs> giving with it away the pencil. Now. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, giving, I'm not giving anything away. She's using the iPad Pro, a 9.7, with her pencil and reaches over to tap something on her phone yeah. with the pen, and it's like and it does nothing i was like it's like ah right it's, it's like being shocked with electricity i really hope they do bring uh pencil support to the iphone at some point i'm not holding my breath but it would be nice uh but yeah so that so that is the situation uh i am planning on getting both of the new ipad pros at the same time i am planning on getting them at the same time because what i want to do is i want to go back to the situation that I had before when I had a smaller iPad Pro before it got used in another way of having an ability to separate out different areas of my working life. Yeah. And in, in particular, I, the, the place I really, do, the only place that I don't like the 12.9 is on the couch. I feel like it is too big of a machine to be using on the couch yep i feel like it's like it's almost a wall between you and the other people on the couch it's too big of a screen it's like distracting for the other person who's on the couch is the only place i don't like it and that's where i would definitely want to use a smaller machine and uh when i had the 97 i always found that i was actually like a really great admin machine sitting on the couch uh, and so that that is my plan for the 105 is to use it in in that way and like in that situation in particular and a few other things but the 129 is still going to be my main general purpose computer that I use for everything that's not a, a specialized task one thing though is I haven't actually seen a 129 yet mm -hmm. and I'm a little bit scared of that because the 12.9 inch iPad has also gained the True Tone display. Mm -hmm. That display, the True Tone display with the 120 megahertz refresh rate, is going to be bonkers. So I'm worried that like I'm going to go to the store mm -hmm. to get my 10.5, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to take a look at the 12.9, right, and walk out with both of them. Which I don't really want to do straight away. There's going to be little sparkles around it. There's going to yeah. be a little little spotlight coming down from the ceiling, happy music, and you're not going to be able to resist. Is that your concern? That is my concern. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have my iPad fund mm -hmm. because I got to save for longer than I was expecting <laughs> right. for my refreshes. Right. So the money is there anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's 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 bought already. It's like, probably we know, we know how that is. I mean, the reason is is like I know I'm going to do it, and it's my plan to to refresh them both. But it was I wanted to be able to spend more time with the the newest hardware, like mm -hmm. the 10.5, before get, having them both, so I could really put the 10.5 through its paces. Mm -hmm. But we'll see how it ends up when I actually go to the store. Yeah. Oh, new keyboards as well. Mm -hmm. So the 10.9 inch is obviously it's a big because it's bigger. The keys are bigger. Mm -hmm. Have you played with this new smart keyboard at all? Yeah, I, I have had a chance to play with the uh, the smart keyboard on the ten point five. It looks bigger. I mean, I, when I look at it, I can see it's bigger. Yeah, it, it's. I had an outside hope that maybe there'd be a way to use the ten five as as the main machine because I really like the smart keyboard cover. Uh, but I like I have to have a full size keyboard. It's a real deal breaker. The 10.5 smart keyboard, it's so close, but it's like it's just maybe two centimeters too short. Right. And that's just enough that when I start typing quickly, I start like the number of mistakes goes up very, very fast. Uh, so I I can't use that as a as a general purpose machine. Uh, I do love the lightness of it. It's like there's a big win because the 12.9 is like just under my heaviness it's, threshold it's a tank it, it is it is a total tank if it was two tenths of a pound heavier i i would never use it but i, I find it like it's it's just under that threshold for me so i'm totally fine and the trade-off of having a, a real full-size keyboard is is completely worth it if you're a person who found the old 9.7 smart keyboard just a little too small you might be perfectly fine with it with the 10.5 keyboard it is bigger but it's it's just a little too small for me still and there's like you seen this like sleeve oh yeah yeah this like what i looked at and thought was a completely pointless thing this leather sleeve yeah they showed that they showed that on on screen at the at the keynote i was like well that's dumb 
And then I saw it in person. And it looks real good. <laughs> it's the equivalent of well, you'd see like an old desk and it would have a piece of leather built into the desk as mm. the writing pad area. Yes. It reminds yeah, me of exactly that. It. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So you take your iPad out and you put your little leather sleeve down and you take the pencil out of the mm-hmm. little well that they have for it. It's really nice. It's a nice accessory and it's... If I was ever going to use something like that, it would be seen as like a something to put in and out of a bag. Yeah, that's it. I, I the thing that that made me reconsider that is one, it looks really nice in person. It works with the cover of the iPad, which I I never I just assumed that it wouldn't. Right, I thought like it would be a replacement for having the smart. It's cover. actually made for that. Yeah, that has been measured to be used with the keyboard cover attached. Yeah, that and and that totally changes it because in my mind I just assumed, oh, this is not what it's for. It, it is an alternative cover. Uh, it's not meant to be used mm-hmm. with a keyboard cover. So as soon as I realized that, like, that's great because when I'm traveling in particular, that that's one time I'm very aware of trying not to lose the pencil. And I'm I, like, I feel like I my brain is always on yeah. high alert about where's the pencil when I'm traveling, and. That makes that case really nice that I have a, a unit on an airplane that I can pull out. It has both pieces that I need. And I can put both pieces back and slap it back into the suitcase when I'm done. So I, I think I'll pick up one of those for travel usage, if nothing else. There is one other accessory, which is just a leather ca- cover case for, uh, the yeah. eye- for the pencil. I think that's, that's not, that's not going to happen. That's ridiculous. not going to happen. Like it doesn't make it, it doesn't change it in any way. Like no. it doesn't do anything. Like the pencil is this indestructible piece of acrylic plastic. Like yeah, it doesn't it doesn't need protecting. It doesn't. It's like oh, it got scuffed. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I I'm yeah. incredibly rough on my mm-hmm. hardware. I've never noticed anything with the pencil, like scratch, even scratches. And it's like I'm I'm rolling it through sand and gravel every day. I never notice anything. Good. And, and on the construction site yeah, where exactly. the iPad yeah. is used. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The last one of the last things on the multi pad lifestyle, and it is a it is a tenant of the of the 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 lifestyle mm-hmm. is what happens to the previous devices. Mm-hmm. So if we both replace our current equipment, where do the old ones go? I, I wish I'm just looking around the room right now. Uh, we're in your room. I mm-hmm. wish we were in my room because I would show you what my current twelve point nine inch iPad looks like. And uh, it had a big drop <gasps> like a year ago. Oh. And I thought, oh, it was like, I, it like clunk, it totally dented out the corner. And I thought, ah, whatever. It's not a big deal. But over the months, what has been happening is the screen is slowly, no slowly separating. Uh-oh. Uh, on my 12.9. And... Just like I kept thinking, oh, any day now they'll, re- they'll, re- they'll release one. It's like, I would never have lived with this as a hardware problem for as long as I did. But I kept thinking like, oh, I'm going to be replacing this machine any day now. Because it was like, oh, I'll replace it in September. Oh, it'll be March. Yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, it'll be March. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if it's not March, it's like, well, it's got to be WWDC, right? It's like, yeah, God, it, you could it, be using that thing forever. Yeah. It, it's... It is the the most banged up uh, hardware that I have. So, th- so that 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 twelve nine is not long for this world anyway. So that thing is going to nobody because it'll slice their hands open on yeah. the side where the screen is. So so that thing is is just gone. My wife is going to keep using the smaller iPad Pro because she doesn't want anything that's bigger. She already thinks that one is too mm-hmm. big. So that so that'll stick around. So this is actually for me essentially a, a hardware replacement cycle. Yeah. Okay. But for me, I think I'm just going to shuffle them down the line. Mm-hmm. So like the the current i7 will become the kitchen iPad. Right, right. Or it will become Adina's iPad if she can bear it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the current kitchen iPad, which is in there too, will mm-hmm. go to another member of my family. At 12.9, I have, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm going to do with that yet because I, I don't know if anyone will want it. Just because it's such a, it's a specific device mm-hmm. for a specific type of person. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I'll, I'll have to ask around family and friends if anybody wants to take it off my hands, the covered in sticker device that it is. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. It's, you say it's a, a specific device for a specific person, but I, I can't remember if I've mentioned on the show or not, but um, when that iPad Pro came out, in my family, we had a, a tech support decision, which was transitioning my aunt from mm. this MacBook that she had that was like an eight-year-old MacBook. Uh, it was one of it the was, plastic ones or a metal yeah, one? Yeah, it, it was like, it's, it was so old mm. uh 
it was so old that like Apple would refuse to do any support on it. And it was a really interesting experience because her her needs were so minimal for computing in that like she just does web browsing and email. Uh, she doesn't even really do texts or anything. But when it came around to thinking like, oh, what are we going to do with my aunt? Because this this thing is is not going to make it until the next time I come and visit, right? It's like all the tech support builds up for every time I go to visit my family, and we're realizing like it's not going to last until the next yeah. time that I come. So we have to do something. And I took a gamble with that, and I decided, let's put my aunt on the twelve point nine inch iPad Pro. Now she's the most unpro user in the world, and she loves that machine. Like it, it is. It was it's so it's so interesting to see that like oh actually on the reverse end of the spectrum this is a perfect computer. It has right. a right. full okay. size hardware keyboard and if you set it up so there's just a couple buttons on the home screen, here's your email, here's your web browser, here's some maps and no one can mess around with it, right? There's no yeah. way it can be broken. The tech support requirement is minimum. And it has, like we were saying before, this feature of there's no drop down menus to find stuff in. It's like everything is just on the screen to touch. So uh, I, I've I have actually found like it's very interesting to me that my aunt has has taken to that and totally loves it. And so in a weird way, it's actually a very good machine on the total reverse end of the spectrum. And she uses it just just like a little laptop. I'm not 100 percent sure she knows the screen even comes off, right? But this is like it's just a laptop to her, and she's like, "Oh, the software is different," and she's great. It was no no problem at all. Oh, huh? <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. My computer grew. <laughs> yeah. Is this what we wanted, Gray? Do you feel? Do you feel? Placated isn't the word. Are you satisfied? I mean, we spent a lot of time recently talking about that we were unhappy mm-hmm. with the way that things are going. I've been kind of thinking about this, that like WWDC 2016 to WWDC 2017 was an era of, un- of dissatisfaction and pessimism mm-hmm. in the Apple community, which led to me and you rethinking how we wanted to move going forward. We felt like we were on all fronts losing, yeah. right? Like even our Macs were losing out, which yeah. is the least important of our devices. And we kind of felt like the, the pro users of Apple were being left out in the cold. Yeah. It, it was it was a long walk through the valley of darkness. Yeah, like without a doubt, like it's just been, been bad. Mm-hmm. But as you said earlier in the episode, WWDC twenty seventeen, everyone got everything they wanted. Mm-hmm. So how do you feel? So in our previous episode, I mentioned that if I got everything that I wanted it would still not be enough. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. That that statement is true. I I stand by that statement because what I want to see is not just, oh, we've had a magical year and everybody got everything they wanted, which while I'm extremely happy, there is still that feeling of like some of this stuff just feels way overdue. Like it should have, it should have been sooner. Yep. Like seeing it now, I can understand maybe why, like, okay, multitasking, you were doing a UI refresh with it. Like I can see why these things took a long time, but nonetheless, there still is a little bit of a feeling of like, okay, Apple, we're back on the level. You put on an amazing show, right? It's like, you've got elephants and lions and magic boxes and it's great. Uh, you put on an amazing show and I'm like, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied, very happy, and also satisfied. So I feel that way. It was a great WWDC. I really want to congratulate everybody who was working on it. Like, it's, it's fantastic. I do have that feeling of, I will be truly happy when I see that it is less than two years until this happens again. Like, on, on, a, on, this, on my personal wish list for WWDC, the number one item was, less than two years until the next major round of iPad improvements. And I have that feeling. But I can also say that I feel very confident that it won't be two years until that happens. Why? Because I don't think that the magic box with a gift for everybody was an accident. Like like thinking back over that keynote and looking at all of the things that they did. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize it until after the keynote was over 
how much of the stuff they talked about was future stuff, right? Like they, they wanted to hit everybody's got something. And it's like, hey, uh, we've got new Macs today. Uh, but guess what? There's going to be this totally awesome iMac Pro. It's coming out in December, right? And it's like, hey, we're working on a speaker. Okay, that's coming out later in the year. Like, and they they went through everything so that everybody can feel happy. And that is such a that is such a departure from the normal Apple way of operating. Of we'll wait till it's done. Yeah, we'll wait till it's done, and we'll tell you when it's available for sale right now. And I I just. Maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, but I really do feel like this was an intentional decision to have a total crowd pleaser. And that is a a great opportunity to be a reset button of like, let's make everybody happy. There's something for everybody. And I am taking that as a very good sign that there's an internal reassessment in Apple of even if it's taking us longer to do stuff, let's try to be better about communicating it at the very least. And let's be aware of just updating stuff as we go along. So I may be proven wrong in the future, but I I feel very confident that it's not going to be two years until the next round, that I'm going to see you in San Jose next year, and I'll be able to tick off that top box on this year's wish list of it's not going to take two years for this to happen again. I feel exactly the same as you, but a little bit more so in that I don't like having to be pessimistic all the time. Like it's not No, it's terrible. It's, it's no fun. really frustrating and yeah. it's not happy and it makes me not enjoy my job as much. Mm-hmm. You know, my job has inbuilt in it so much enjoyment for me because I get to do and talk about the things that I love. Mm-hmm. Spending the last maybe nine months being annoyed mm. and frustrated has made my job less fun. Yeah. So I'm my current feeling right now going for the next twelve months is I'm gonna try and be as optimistic as I can because what I have in front of me right now is really exciting. Yes. Because I've been given all the tools that I was looking for. So I'm gonna try and enjoy them as much as possible Mm -hmm. because I feel like that that is a thing that I can do. Like I always try, but last year was not really given anything. So it was really it was like a stretch. Mm -hmm. You know, after the first like three or four or five months it just got really tricky because yeah. it was like, okay, the software sucks, but at least I'm going to get, oh, no, new hardware. Oh, all right, then fine. I'll just, well, new iPhone does, oh, no, all right, then I'll, I'll stick with the current, the way the iPhone looks. Right. Like, the, you know, really, we've got AirPods, which are fantastic. Mm-hmm. That's kind of it, really. Like, in, yeah. in the grand scheme of things, the things that really mm-hmm. surprised and made me happy in the past year, mm-hmm. that was the big one. Yeah. And everything else that I was hoping for, I had to wait a bit longer for. So now I'm like, well, I've, I have all the stuff that I wanted now. They gave it to me in one day. Mm-hmm. And like even the things that I'm not that hot on, like the the HomePod, the Siri speaker music thing, it, I just don't think it's a product for me. That They're focusing way more on music. And I don't really consume music that way at home. I'll, I'll just say I have a suspicion about the HomePod that I've, I've been like, I'm trying to push on everybody, which is I think the name makes sense if you think that the direction that Apple is going is this is go- this device right now is not its incantation oh, of what it's going to be. Yeah, They're like, showing all the music stuff right now because, because Siri have, isn't yeah. at the point where they want it to be. Yeah. And, and it seems like even by the time this ships in December, the story could be really different. Yeah. But just where they are today, they're focusing way more on the music aspect because that's the best feature of it because yeah. it's this incredible speaker. Like as they show it right now, it's not for me. But I'm sure it's actually a product for a lot of people. And if you listen to music at home, like this is a thing in your house, this looks fantastic. And Mm -hmm. I know people that have heard it. And I've read some stuff about people that have actually heard the thing. And for the money, it seems to be an incredibly good speaker. Mm -hmm. But like for me, we like the Amazon Echo at home because of its integrations with services. And, And Apple isn't at that point with this product yet. So I have no desire to change. But I'm not begrudging it. Yeah. Because they're not standing on stage and saying, like, this is our answer to the Echo. Right. Right. They showed the Echo on stage and they're like, they wanted to make a product that was a combination between a really great speaker like a Sonos and something smart like an Echo. And it seems to have that because you can do some serious stuff with it. But it's definitely not their answer to it. Not yet. Mm-hmm. I believe, like you, that it will be because the clue is in the name. Yeah. That is, is like talking about what are we expecting in the future? I feel like the HomePod name 
is an arrow pointing in the direction of future development. Yeah. And it can do some stuff like it can act as the like base of your HomeKit devices. I can't remember the actual terminology Apple used, but effectively like the home server for those devices. Right, yeah. It can do that where the Apple TV can currently do it. So like yeah. it has some functionality there. Or or an old iPad, which is or my, an old iPad. Which is which is my central server. Mine for is it. by accident. My kitchen iPad is by accident, my <laughs> home home part home right, kit yeah. thing. Um but like so it it's got that stuff, but it's like I'm not annoyed about this. Mm -hmm. Like, what I wanted was Apple to give me something that I could replace my Echo with, but they didn't, but it's fine. Mm -hmm. Because I'll just keep using my Amazon. I like my Amazon Echo. I'm cool with it. But I know that if they wouldn't have given me the iPad stuff, my overall feeling would have been pessimism, and I would have been really annoyed about the HomePod, right? (laughs) Right, yeah. Because that's what the last year has been, that every announcement that Apple has had has not been good enough. Right. Because... They weren't necessarily what I was looking for, and they also hadn't given me anything else, yeah. right? And, there, and it's just like there, there is an alternate universe where this WWDC keynote has, uh, you know, maybe no new iPads or like it's just missing a bunch of stuff. But they still have that kaleidoscope watch face, and I would be burning yep. down the world, right? Oh, the, do you know what the <laughs> other thing is? I've recorded two shows. I've listened to two shows. Nobody talks about the opening video. Oh, right. Yes, of course. Which yeah. was funny, but in points, kind of tone deaf. That that video is going to come to bite Apple in the ass eventually, because someday they're going to have a major iCloud like outage, yeah. and that is going to be the first thing that people on the yep. internet remix. It's like, oh, right. Remember when you made the video about a big disaster at your data center? <laughs> yeah. And then, it was a, and then nobody could use their phones and we started yeah. the apocalypse. But that's not being brought up yeah. where it would be usually. Yeah. But we just haven't got time to criticize. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's also in, in the scope of things. I mean, just, just to touch back upon it briefly, like I, I think maybe the worst decision that Apple made when we were in the Valley of Darkness, was releasing the book about how fantastic all of their products are. I, I think that is maybe the most tone-deaf yeah, thing Apple has ever it done very, very in stupid. the history of the company. It's like, guys, hold off that book just until after this WWDC, right? And it's like, that, that is a, an example of like, it seems like you're showing off a bunch of stuff while you have, you've got nothing to back it up. And... So I'm thinking like with this WWDC, it's like, okay, is that first video a little tone deaf? Is that kaleidoscope watch face maybe the worst thing I've ever seen? But it doesn't, like you're willing to go totally past it because it's like, look at that sexy iMac Pro. Like, ah, you're a dumb video, whatever. Like, who cares? Oh my God, you put new processors in a MacBook Pro already? Yeah, it's only ex- been yeah, six it's like, months. Like, like, and, no. and so it's, it's this feeling like when you're doing amazing things, the people who like your products are also willing to cut you a lot of runway. And if you're just silent and doing nothing and everything is unhappy, then the story turns to yep. like everything you do is a PR disaster and a waste of waste of resources. So I feel that like, I feel like Apple has bought themselves a lot of runway with this WWDC. And it's also because of that signaling that I, I feel confident that they're they're going to do more stuff in, in the future. And I'm, I'm viewing this as like reset WWDC. I'm very I'm just really relie- I'm relieved. Yeah, because I was dreading. Like, I was just really, on so many fronts, dreading mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. right? It's like, I'm not going to get the tools that I want mm-hmm. to do my work, and I'm going to have to spend months more mm-hmm. being just really frustrated. Yeah. And I have to say, other thing I've really liked about that that keynote, going back to what we were talking about, being in San Jose with everybody, everybody's in such a good mood. Yeah. it's It's like, you can tell every person who is here is super happy. The, you know, everybody has something, everybody has excited things to talk about is like the whole mood of the Apple community, which is orbiting around that convention center. It's like everybody is great. Whereas I remember last year, there was really that feeling of like, ooh, stickers is great. But like, what's happening? Where yeah. were the things? It was, it was a totally different mood when you talk to people versus this year. And, and this year, it, it has made being in San Jose genuinely more enjoyable because you can everybody's excited about something and wants to talk about something so well done apple yeah thanks to mike for setting up this thing in person wasn't too bad which has been a little weird but it's been way it's been fine it's been easier yeah than i was expecting 
I think maybe actually this has made it a little bit more like our lunches actually are. I feel like this conversation has mm. been a bit more casual than other conversations. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we start looking into some don't shared count on this space. in the future <laughs> is what I'm saying. Don't count on this in the future. All right, man, we got to go. There's more WWDC. More things to do. More things to do. Thanks for the horrible audio there. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Let's get out of here.